Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Elliot Cohen, uh, Professor Chiedu Wanko, uh, all the distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to say a few words on the topic Africa US reengagement, a new foreign policy agenda at this year's uh, John Hopkins African Studies Program Conference. And I'd really like to thank the African Studies Program and uh, Professor Chiedu Wanko in particular for this, for this very kind uh, invitation. The timing of this conversation is, is auspicious for a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, President Biden's speech in February to uh, African leaders at the AU summit signaled a new, more robust uh, partnership, to quote him, uh, in solidarity, support, and mutual respect. Second, uh, at the top of the new uh, administration's foreign policy agenda are two topics of crucial importance to, to African states, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the fallouts, and uh, what to do uh, going forward, and climate change. Third, uh, the positive signals from the U.S. Congress, uh, the chair of the House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, George Nix, in his first public statement called for a new Africa policy, which he said would be his top priority. And fourthly, and more broadly, uh, perhaps is a view expressed by many who have given the matter some thought, uh, that the 21st century will be the African century. In other words, for good or ill, the fate of Africa will impact on the rest of the world in this century uh, because of its increasing share of humanity and because of its indispensable contribution to managing uh, the global commons, be it to improve human security, to avert pandemics, or indeed to tackle uh, the crisis uh, caused by climate change. Let me expatiate a bit on this. It's estimated, for instance, that Africa will account for 25% of global population by 2050, up from about 17% today. So that's an 8% uh, uh, increase. Indeed, my own country, Nigeria, is projected to be the third most populous country in the world by that date, by 2050, after India and China. If this increasing share of global population is reflected in economic productivity and increased material well-being, then it surely augurs well for the world. If, however, it brings about increased poverty and misery, then Africa could become a hotbed of restive youth that are vulnerable to the negative promptings of you know, maniacal populists and religious radicals, and, and also for the other global concerns, such as climate change, so such as climate change. Distractions such as worsening poverty, violent extremism, dysfunctional governments can only worsen uh, matters. So I think that a resetting of, of US foreign policy agenda with Africa should promote a partnership that brings about economic prosperity, increases security, combats disease, improves governance, and mitigates uh, the, the, the effects of climate change. Africa is in many ways, and I'm sure that most will agree, uh, the last frontier for economic development. And it has the potential to be a, gro a, a global uh, a growth pole. Indeed, as other parts of the world are looking inwards, Africa is moving confidently to integrate its economies through the Africa Union Agenda 2063, as well as the recent establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreements. As Asian countries move to produce more sophisticated goods and services, and of course, as labor becomes more expensive there, Africa has a good chance to become the factory of the world. This would require investments in machinery, in skills and technologies to improve productivity and increase uh, returns. So I think the US is well placed to lead trade and investment ties with Africa. And it already has a good leg in with the African Growth and Opportunities Act, uh, AGOA. The legislation, this legislation, AGOA, removed all tariffs on 6,400 products available for export to the US. 
and it saw some African countries, a few though, benefiting considerably. South Africa's auto exports to the US under Goa have created thousands of jobs in that country and in the auto supply value chain in several neighboring countries. Export of garments from other countries such as Ethiopia, Mauritius, Lesotho, Eswatini, and Kenya have also created a large number of jobs. But Agoa's challenge, you know, aside from the fact that only a small number of African countries have actually benefited, are also the changing dynamics of trade within Africa since uh, Agoa was passed 20 years ago. So, for example, the EU, the, the European Union, has signed several EPAs with several countries, several African countries, which have implications for tariff disparities that may need to be reviewed in order to create a, a more level playing field. Also, the African Continental Free Trade Agreements are set to kick in, and AGOA must now be implemented consistent with the AFCTA. AGOA expires in, 20, in 2025, but I believe that a new and improved AGOA that takes these challenges into account can be negotiated well ahead of 2025. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the need to coordinate actions to prevent and tackle pandemics, while also building up uh, public health infrastructure in developed and developing countries alike. The reality, however, is that Africa still bears a disproportionate burden of communicable diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, HIV, meningitis, to mention a few. The U.S. has helped to improve healthcare outcomes in Africa, including through uh, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR. Uh, and I think that that same spirit of collaboration with regard to making COVID-19 vaccines available to African countries is now called for. This is not a time for vaccine nationalism and export bans, which we've seen uh, here and there. But it's a time for working together towards universal vaccination against the disease. And I believe the U.S. can lead in that effort to ensure that all countries and their peoples can access vaccines irrespective of the resources available to them. And quite frankly, uh, already some support, uh, we've seen quite a bit of support. The U.S. has uh, rejoined uh, COVAX, of course, rejoined the WHO. All of this was very helpful in creating at least the right environment for more cooperation towards, uh, uh, towards increasing uh, uh, vaccine availability and solving uh, some of the problems associated uh, with, the, uh, with the difficulty in, re in getting vaccines today. I to leave that and go to uh, conflicts. All too often, I think people outside the continent, outside the African continent, tend to see Africa as a conflict ridden continent beset by insurgencies and wild-eyed terrorists. There has undoubtedly been increased restiveness in certain parts of Africa, which is driven or aided by poverty, alienation, environmental degradation, and poor governance. In truth, though, the troubles in the main are due to an encroachment of globally known terror groups or their franchises in different parts of Africa. The US has had uh, counterterrorism presence in Africa, in about 15 African countries, in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa in particular, combating jihadist terrorist groups who operate largely in the Sahel, especially the Sub-Saharan Sahel region and the areas further southwest around the Lake Chad, Nigeria, especially Northern Nigeria, Somalia, and also Mozambique. Uh, the US Africa Command, you know, uh, Africa, has been, of course, a very active force in all of the activities of the US in this region. So while it is evident that the threat of violent extremist organizations is growing, it's very clear that that threat is growing, it will appear uh, that US policy uh, has, since 2020, shifted from the strategy of degrading violent extremist organizations in West Africa in particular to simply containing their spread. But the escalation of the attacks and the synergies being created amongst these 
extremist groups calls for a review of that provision of that position. I think that that provision of containment, you know, uh, needs to be needs to be reviewed. It may be the moment for a more robust intervention along the lines of U.S.-backed operations in clearing terrorists and insurgents in the Middle East. I think that we have a I, th I think that we have a moment now where just on account of the you know of, of the escalation of insurgencies, especially in the West African region, of course, uh, it's a help for a more robust uh, U.S. intervention. I think this is something that uh, U.S. foreign policy, along with uh, African partners, may wish to take a second look at. A key tenet of U.S. foreign policy has, has been to uphold the values and principles such as democracy, human rights, rule of law, and public accountability. Uh, these issues resonate very strongly with ordinary Africans who believe that improved governance is crucial in ensuring that their votes count, that their rights are protected, and that state resources are used for the common good. And United States engagement with Africa, I think, uh, should uh, naturally take these matters on board. However, uh, I must say that it should not take the shape of finger wagging, but rather a balanced and joint endeavor to achieve these objectives. To paraphrase President Biden, one that is based on mutual respect. Whatever the case, there should be no rush to judgment, but an effort to hear the other side. And I think we should create more opportunities to hear the other side, not through uh, lobbying firms and that sort of thing, but more direct uh, governmental types of uh, meetings and, uh, uh, and interactions that enable uh, both governments better understand what their points of view are. And I think we have a perfect opportunity for doing so now. This does not imply, in my view, turning a blind eye to gross infractions of international law and human rights. But it does require, in my view, a broader and more nuanced perspective of issues uh, as well as an understanding of local dynamics before taking, uh, uh, before taking a stand. Uh, as I had said earlier, climate change, including the risk of a perfect storm of population pressure, environmental degradation, and pandemics, pose a serious threat to African development in particular and the world in general. It's, it, it seems to me uh, that the United States and Africa must then work together to tackle climate change and moderate global warming, including through an energy transition from fossil fuels to renewable energies. African countries have already made commitments in this regard towards implementing the Paris Climate Change Agreement targets. And we all have our targets, our NDCs, and we are you know, working hard towards achieving them. However, the, 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 the commitment to net zero emissions by 2050 has led to a growing trend among development finance institutions to withdraw from fossil fuel investments, including the World Bank's decision to cease funding for upstream and oil and gas development, for upstream oil and gas development, and the new restrictions on financing downstream gas developments, which is currently uh, being considered and, and in fact being implemented by some European Union countries. The United Kingdom uh, uh, and the US have also been considering uh, these defunding of gas projects. While these may be well intentioned, I think that this move does not take into account the principles of common but differentiated responsibility and leaving no one behind. Which are, enshrined, which are enshrined in the global treaties around sustainable development and climate action. These are principles that we all agree to. These are principles that uh, we, we all accept. You know, uh, a shared responsibility, leaving no one behind. I think that the move to defund uh, gas projects disregards the importance of gas as a means to urgently address energy poverty in a technologically and economically viable manner. And furthermore, increasing the use of gas, which of course is a cleaner fossil fuel in power generation, gives African countries 
the opportunity to phase out more polluting fuels such as coal, diesel, and heavy fuel oil while bringing on board more renewables. I think the U.S. Uh, should lend its weight to stopping this manifestly unfair trend that can undermine the sense of collective responsibility we all have towards mitigating climate change. What is required is a just transition to zero emissions, and that expression is becoming increasingly popular. One where, in our view, one where the developed economies meet the commitments made at COP15 in Copenhagen of 100 billion US dollars yearly to assist uh, developing economies to transit uh, to zero, uh, zero emissions. US-Africa relations need not be unidimensional. And uh, the United States, of course, is not a global leader in economic and military terms, as well as through its contributions to the norms that shape the global order. So I think that, they, uh, that the US could work with Africa, either under the auspices of the Africa Union, or indeed through individual countries like Nigeria, to build a better world. Africa should not be seen or, you know, or used as a pawn in the great power games nor as an arena in the contest to secure strategic minerals and natural resources, but rather as a partner in building a more secure, a more peaceful and prosperous world. Indeed, rather than view every interaction with Africa from uh, a competitive lens, I think that the U.S. can work with other countries to support Africa in its efforts to meet our infrastructural needs, infrastructure in the form of power stations, ports, rail networks, roads, will spur growth and reduce the time and cost of doing business. The fiscal constraints of African countries means that there is a scope for private capital to fund, operate, and own some of these things. So given their technical know-how and financial resources, US companies should engage or could engage in the provision of infrastructure in Africa. And we do expect that the US International Development Finance Corporation may support some of these efforts. So cooperation and partnerships rather than competition with other global actors, I believe can complement these efforts. And I also think that the US could work with partners, including the G20, to establish an international economic system that works for Africa and other developing countries. It's a very encouraging sign in this regard that the US has signaled support for the 650 billion increase in special drawing rights at the IMF which will go a long way in providing much liquidity in African countries, given the fiscal uh, constraints caused by last year's economic downturn. Similarly, the recent initiative of the US to ensure that businesses are taxed where they make their sales is a major step forward in bringing about a fairer international tax regime. To be effective, however, it should apply not just to a few multinational companies, but should be truly global in nature. Otherwise, African countries may be excluded from getting their fair share of such taxes. I, I, I think I'll just stop here uh, so that I can take a few questions before my time completely runs out. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, for listening.